Connection Wild Turkey Edition today. So we asked for viewers questions ahead of time, but y'all go ahead and chime in with your questions too. Now we have two awesome guests joining us today. Dr. Brett Collier, the Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology at LSU. And we have another special guest, Dr. Mike Chamberlain, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Georgia. Um, can y'all kind of just talk about what y'all do first off? Uh, yeah, Mike, you want to go first or you want me to? Either one. Okay, um, so uh, I'll go first. So uh, my name is Brett Collier. Uh, I'm a uh, associate professor of uh, wildlife ecology at Louisiana State University. I work for the uh, School of Renewable Natural Resources, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a game uh, ecologist. So I study typically things that people like to go hunt, uh, with turkeys being pretty much my uh, general expertise right now. But I also work on things like deer and uh, quail and, you know, a little bit on ducks and gallinule and various uh, small mammal species and whatnot, depending upon whatever we uh, happen to be needing to gather scientific information on. But for about the last, I guess, 20 years, I've been studying turkeys uh, pretty much full time. Yeah, so I'm Mike Chamberlain. I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. I've been studying all sorts of critters for the last 25 years. Um, everything from black bears, deer, coyotes, you name it. But by far, um, most of my research right now is and has been for the past at least seven or eight years is mostly on wild turkeys. Awesome. Well, we'll start out y'all with some questions that um, I took beforehand from our viewers. So first question, we had a question on um, predators, like what predators um, hunt turkey or like, you know, things like that, y'all would know. Sure, so the, the, the question we usually get fairly regularly whenever uh, as professionals we interact with the public is, you know, what, what are the primary predators for wild turkeys? Um, and there's, there's three kind of distinctive periods that we think about when we think about predator ecology and how it relates to wild turkeys. Um, so the first is, uh, and I'll, I'll go from kind of the nest up to the adult. So with nests, whenever a, a wild turkey female is sitting on a nest, the, the nest never moves. Um, and there's a, a host of predators that will predate the nest. Um, probably the primary predator that predates a nest and actually eats the eggs is snakes. Um, you know, you will have things like uh, raccoons, foxes, bobcats, uh, coyotes, um, possums that, that all come in and, and will predate nests. Um, but uh, we do see a lot of loss of our nests to snakes. Um, owls will actually predate the nesting females whenever they're incubating on the nest. Owls will swoop down at night and, and sometimes get the females. Um, we also typically, you know, you'll have the standard uh, bobcats that tend to eat uh, female wild turkeys, you know, whenever they're on the nest. Um, poults, uh, everything eats poults, um, but, but not so much in the, the raccoon or, or possum, but more of a bobcats, snakes, coyotes, foxes, hawks. Lots of hawks will predate uh, turkey poults. Um, we've actually had little transmitter poults that we found the transmitters uh, up in the red-tailed hawk nests up in the trees, tracked them to the trees. Um, so we, we tend to see a lot of a wide variety of species that predate uh, turkey nests and, and eat the poults. Um, for adults, it's, it's typically a little bit different. Um, male wild turkeys, their primary predator is man um, through hunting season. Um, males don't typically die very regularly. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're typically traveling around with a, uh, another group of males and there's a lot of eyes and they're just living because they don't spend a lot of time actively engaging in the nesting activities that females do. Um, but they, but both males and females, whenever they're, you know, adults, um, they get predated on the standard things you think, you know, bobcats a lot, owls. Um, you know, we've seen some pretty good pictures of owls trying to take turkeys off of logs and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, if occasionally a coyote will get one. So it's not so much coyotes as everyone thinks sometimes, huh? No. Coyotes, and Mike can jump in here in a second, but coyotes typically get a very bad rap as being the kind of ubiquitous predator on a landscape. And right. we see a lot of photographs of coyotes um, on trail cameras when we're watching turkey nests or, you know, studying the areas around turkey nests. But a lot of time they're carrying deer. Um, they're not carrying turkeys around. Mike, is there anything you want me to add to that? 
Yeah, I went to uh, study Kaya diets, which I've done quite a bit of over the past few decades. We see very few turkey remains in their diet. Um, most of the evidence suggests at this point that, that coyotes are more of a, an indirect risk to turkey. I mean, the birds know they're there. They're harassed by this, this dog. They're chased. They're spooked. They're disrupted. But they're not, at least at this point, a uh, primary predator of adults. Sure, they kill birds, but, but not like, like Brad has mentioned, not like cats and, and horned owls are the two biggies that we see for sure. Okay, okay. We got some comments over here, guys, saying uh, thank you guys for hosting. Chris says hello. Joey Blackburn saying thanks, guys, for doing this. Jason Hart says greetings from South Carolina. And Jason Hart wants to say he'd love to hear more about spur length in relation to age, geography, and genetics. Can y'all elaborate on that? Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, Jason. Uh, glad you're able to tune in today. Appreciate you. Um, yeah. So uh, spur length is typically thought to be correlated with the age of a bird up to a point. Um, most of the time, the the spurs are going to max out at some length. And it doesn't matter how many more years the, the turkey puts on, it's not going to continue to grow at the same rate. So it's not like a deer antler where it just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Um, usually, and you, you know, you don't want to be too specific, but you can usually assume that uh, a Jake, the first year uh, post hatch is going to be a little nub, a, you know, a male that's about two years old is going to fall somewhere within the, you know, three and a quarter inch range. Um, uh, uh, you know, male, an adult, you know, about three, you know, a few seasons past being a hatch is probably going to get up inch, inch and a half, but you're pretty, you know, it's not going to be, they get to be six years old and they've got a four inch spur on them. Um, okay. there is some, some deviation in the subspecies that we do see. Um, Easterns tend to have a little bit longer spurs than most of your Western birds, your, your Rios and your Merriams. Um, Osceolas tend to be about on par with Easterns. Um, Goulds, uh, most of the Gould spurs that I've seen uh, have been moderately short. I'd say three quarters of an inch to an inch uh, for the adults. And that's some work that uh, uh, Brian Wakeling, uh, who was at uh, Arizona Game and Fish, did a, a long time ago. Um, but we haven't had a lot of Goulds in the United States harvested to measure yet. But most of it is probably just subspecies differences. And then you get a little bit of individual variation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah we see... I, I tell students in class, these textbooks that used to say, say, well, if it's three quarters of an inch to seven eighths, it's two years old. If it's an inch and an eighth to an inch and a quarter, it's three years old, it, it, et cetera. That, that is false. We, we see birds, known age birds all the time that are banded as jakes that pop up years later that have really long spurs or really short spurs. So length is not and a good indicator of age. Um, I mean, bottom line is spurs are kind of like other parts of their anatomy. They they vary widely across individuals and genetics and regions and like Brett saying, subspecies is the big is the big determinant. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Well, thank y'all. Uh, Ricky's asking, what is your take on the reduction in population being seen in many states? Oh, hey, hey, Ricky, that's got to be Ricky Paget, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, uh, so speaking for Mike and I, we're concerned. Um, we've seen pretty much over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, fairly consistent declines in wild turkey populations at the, the broader scale. Um, now, obviously, there are going to be people who have seen, you know, increases locally. So we're, we're going to take a, a very 10,000 foot view here and think about it from the, the regional or the statewide scale or the, even the southeastern scale as a whole. Um, we've seen uh, across the board pretty consistent, sometimes fast, sometimes slow, depending on what state you're in, declines in, in wild turkey numbers. Um, these are not issues that are strictly restricted to the southeast. Um, the northeastern United States are starting to see this occur. The Midwest uh, uh, United States is starting to see this occur. Um, our take on it, I think, is is multifold. Um, there's not a we don't have the perfect answer yet, but we're working on it. Um, we've seen declines in our poult per hen ratios. So historically, whenever surveys were done uh, during restoration, you'd have yeah, anywhere from 
two to six poults with every hen that was seen kind of on average. And now we're moving to where our surveys are showing one poult or less per hen that we're seeing. So we're seeing declines in reproduction. Um, we're also seeing that turkey hunting is, as a sport has uh, kind of exploded uh, nationally. Um, it's one of the few sports where we're still gaining hunters, uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but with, with the increase in hunter numbers, uh, and, you know, you do see increases in harvest at the statewide scale. So, and some of our harvest curves, especially in the Midwest, are starting to turn over where we're kind of hit the peak harvest. And now it's kind of leveling off. Um, you know, we've seen landscape changes in vegetation communities over time. Uh, where we, you know, some of the same issues that they were talking about with uh, northern bobwhite quail 40 and 50 years ago that came to fruition, we're now seeing for turkeys as well. Um, so we're, you know, working a lot with uh, managers with the, both federal and state agencies to try and work on uh, creating usable space. Um, you know, there's probably a suite of factors that play into it. It's not a single silver bullet out there that's going to solve it. And that's kind of what we're trying to focus in on. So, Mike, you got anything you want to add to that? No, that's that's pretty good synopsis. Okay, we had Joey Blackburn asking, like, he seems like states with the eastern subspecies are hit harder, especially versus the Rio Grande's. Is there a subspecies difference in reproduction success? He recently returned from Florida, and there are birds everywhere. Am I making the decline in eastern up, or just hunting bad spots? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you're hunting. If you're seeing birds everywhere, I want to join you. Um, so you're you're not making the decline up the the typically your birds in your semi-arid communities and, and i'll talk about rios um but this would go generally equivalent for merriams and goulds um typically if you have good weather and good rains in the spring you get pulses of those birds um reproduction wise they, they they're very successful and then we've seen this for years and years in monitoring in places like texas and oklahoma and new mexico and arizona um easterns typically exist on a much more stable gradient where you know the the environmental conditions are fairly consistent so they don't see these massive pulses in reproduction that uh, your western birds do but you have to combine that with the fact that if there's no rain in the west western birds don't try and reproduce your semi-arid birds won't nest if it's dry um easterns will so then you compound the the fact that you're not getting a lot of production in some years with the fact that you're actually losing females so you can actually see regional localized regional declines that just kind of peak and valley a lot slower than you do in some of the pulses you see for our western birds okay cool uh we got scott here asking i followed the web center study but would love to hear more discussion about gobbler movement during the spring season they all have a breeding home range they move about and often shift roofs but how about big walkabouts? Um, okay, I'm glad you followed the Web Center study. That was a, a lot of fun. I'm sure Jay Cantrell's on here watching and he appreciates that. Um, so the, the Web study was a, a project, for those of you who don't know, that was done at the, the Web Wildlife Management Area um, in uh, South Carolina in conjunction with South Carolina DNR, where we looked at uh, male movement ecology, female reproductive ecology, um, how hunters moved on the landscape, uh, those type of things. and, and those data, are, I think Mike puts a lot of it up on Facebook and it's, it's fairly readily available to anyone that wants to read about it. Um, males do tend to uh, exist on the landscape in groups, but they don't typically transition between male groups that often during the reproductive season. Um, most of our males on the web center were pretty stationary, um, pretty resident. They didn't run on any real big walkabouts. You know, you'd have a couple that would hop across the river, the Savannah River into Georgia, um, we'd have maybe one that would run three or four miles off of the web center, but typically they had pretty uh, stable ranges would be a real easy way to look at it. Um, now that said, um, I have seen birds and, and we've had GPS units on birds that have made some inordinate movements, both during hunting seasons and, and in October, where they just pick up and move and go 25 or 30 miles one direction and hang out for a couple of days and then move back. And, you know, those are kind of the exception as opposed to the rule. So I, I hope that answers this question. We'll see if he's got any more to say. Uh, Easton is asking, in many areas of where I'm from, central Ohio, there's a sizable chunks of timber that appear to be very suitable for turkeys to thrive. However, there are no turkeys to be found. Why might it be that we're told that hunk 
uh, turkey populations are leveling out based upon the amount of habitat they are given, yet we have many suitable places that go uninhabited by turkeys. Okay, no, that's a good question. So, um, so I don't know what when you exactly looked at the areas and, and they don't have turkeys, but I'll try and shed a little bit of light. So um, basically, whenever these birds go to their, their winter flocks, their wintering areas, they, they tend to kind of join up and leave areas that you may have seen them in the spring or the summer. Um, and they, they create their kind of wintering groups. And then they use a very small area. I mean, there's a flock down the road here from the house that I guarantee doesn't exist in an area bigger than about 60 acres of woods and a couple of cornfields around them. Um, but the, the areas that they typically, after they get through wintering and they expand out, those females may move two to three miles in a straight line going out to lay their nest sites. So what you might see as something being uh, uninhabited or not usable habitat may just mean that it's not being used right now. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are potentially limitations um, on where birds have expanded to. Um, you know, there can be areas where locally there's just not a lot of birds. We have a farm in Illinois and we you know, just don't have turkeys on it. And there's no reason they shouldn't be there. Um, but occasionally you'll just have little pockets on the landscape where you don't have birds. Um, so not all space is potentially used. And that's because turkeys aren't distributed uniformly across the landscape. They do have some selectivity that we may not actually know about. Cool. Mike, okay. you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just say you know, the other thing that we're realizing is turkeys don't disperse like we thought they, they should. They don't move as far when they disperse across the landscape as, as young birds like other species. So they, these young hens, they hang around with mom and they end up creating these, these, you know, these mixed flocks in the winter. And those flocks don't disperse off to broad areas like say a coyote would or a yearling buck or something that may travel 10 or 20 miles. Turkeys don't do that. So you could have an, uh, an unoccupied part of the landscape for whatever reason just stays unoccupied because there aren't enough birds nearby that can kind of patch it together like a puzzle to get birds to that particular spot and it, it could stay like that for decades yeah. okay and yeah, you awesome. do the chris berzos uh, i think it's berzos question that's popped up there that's what i was about to ask yes. you about. so chris said i that's noticed a good question i noticed you seem to particularly leave out feral hogs as an additive percentage of nest egg predators that has appeared on the landscape relatively recently compared to all the other predators yep. this is concerning to me especially with respect to some research in texas i am assuming you're aware of which may indicate that feral hogs may be a bit more than opportunistic than expected also there appears to be an additive percentage of nest predation with these hogs which may top the list with other predators Sure. So, Chris, um, to get to your question, um, feral hogs aren't a primary nest predator for wild turkeys. Um, in the hundreds, I don't, I don't even know what the number is, six or seven hundred that Mike and I have looked at, which are actual live turkey nests. Um, feral hogs typically are a secondary or tertiary predator, which means after something else comes in and either predates the hen or predates the nest, they come in and kind of clean up the scraps. Um, we've seen females stand off feral hogs before on, you know, digital cameras. Um, they're not as willing to leave their nest for, say, a feral hog or a snake or a deer as they would be for, say, a coyote or a bobcat, because there's no true th threat of predation to the female for that. Um, I, I am familiar with the work that you're talking about in Texas. Um, and, and just a couple of things to note. Um, it wasn't a study of turkey nests. It was a study of basically chicken eggs put on the landscape. They're called dummy nests. Um, and that's how we do science and that's okay. But what they did was they figured out where the feral hogs were and then they saturated that landscape with eggs. And by saturating the landscape where the pigs ranges are based on GPS units, when that occurs, there's no way that the feral hogs can't actually find those nests and predate them. The nests that they had put out actually have no defense mechanism. So there was no female that would theoretically defend them from the feral hogs as well. Um, and probably the only other thing I would just generally add to, to the, the feral hog debate is Mike and I have probably uh, conservatively looked at six or 700 nests over the last uh, half dozen years. That'd be a good number, Mike. Yep. 
Yeah. And we've only found evidence of a actual feral hog predation of a single nest. Um, and I've worked in, in, te- in South Texas on Rio's where there are feral hogs everywhere. I work in Louisiana on Easterns. We have abundant feral hog populations on every place that we work, um, but they're just not the ones that are really driving nest loss on our landscapes. Um, it's typically ascribed to other species. And- yeah, I would just add too that that, that study also concluded um, that that pigs were changing their, their movement patterns and home patterns to use the areas where those nests were being put on the landscape. So in other words, what they were doing is they were saturating the landscape with eggs and then attracting pig activity. Um, Brett's point is, is a critical one. Without that hen present, it's, it's very difficult to conclude how a predator is going to interact with that nest. A dummy nest, I, you know, we do it. I'm not criticizing it. it. They're very useful in a number of situations, but the, the absence of that hen at that nest and creating a distribution and density of nest on a landscape that don't mimic what wild turkeys actually do, those, those are two things you need to consider when you interpret that type of work because those nests were not distributed like a turkey would distribute nest on the landscape. Um, we have another one from TJ. He said, we see a lot of hunters question the reasons for starting the season later in the year. Can you touch on the benefits and reasoning behind this? Would it be beneficial for states to decrease limits due to the fact that they may be seeing declines in birds and increase in hunters? Okay, so there's there's two questions there, and I'll, I'll try and do them in order, and then I'll let Mike chime in, if that's okay with you, Mike. Um, so mm-hmm. the first question was with regard to season timing. So biologically, and this is kind of how – turkey biology has evolved over time. Um, We've always felt that it's appropriate for us to start the hunting of the birds after we've kind of reached the the first peak in females going off to nest. And and depending on where you are in the United States, that's a pretty broad range, but let's just call it as a ballpark about the middle of April. Um, In in the Southeast, that's about a good average for, for when most females are kind of moving out to make their first nesting attempt. Um, over time, was it TJ? I think it was. Um, over yeah. time, what's happened, TJ, is um, social pressure effectively has moved the timing of our hunting seasons to be earlier and earlier. Now, typically, the social pressure is due to the uh, the gobbling activity. Um, hunters want to I as a hunter, and all hunters want to hear birds gobbling, right? We want to go out in the woods. We want to hear birds gobbling. Um, but turkeys are like about any other male species. They tend to get ramped up before the females are ready to reproduce. So the males are gobbling. They're competing for social dominance. Um, they're structuring their social hierarchy. They're making noise that lets everybody know that they're there. And that's before any of the actual breeding occurs. And and there's been some, you know, just – anecdotal statements hunters worry about the birds being gobbled out and there's a lot of really cool research being done on gobbling chronology and when it occurs and how it's being tied to reproductive timing right now and that's something that that mike and i are both uh you know acutely engaged in um and then uh the second part of the question and and just make sure i get this right the second question was with regards to uh, bag limits right Um, yeah he said, should we decrease limits due to the fact that we may be seeing declines in birds? Yeah, I can't answer whether you should or shouldn't. Um, those are regulatory decisions that are made by state wildlife agencies, state commissions, based on the science that people like myself do. Um, what I can say is there are several states that, that I'm aware of that are either doing experimental exa- evaluations of season timing right now, um, my state of Louisiana being one of them. Um, we're also, uh, there are some states that are considering uh, changing bag limits. Uh, for example, South Carolina has made some adjustments where you can shoot one male, I think the first uh, week or 10 days uh, before you can take your second one. So there's, there's a lot of science and kind of field-based experimentation that's going on to kind of start addressing that, uh, that concern that harvest may have an impact on, on turkey populations. Uh, Mike, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just just briefly that, um, you know, we've known for years that turkey seasons, if you wanted a conservative framework, should open around peaks and incubation. Those those recommendations were provided in the early to mid 90s. 
Um, the reasons being that you typically want to protect those dominant toms until hens are at least in their laying sequence for a variety of reasons uh, and or in their incubation sequence. And if they're not, then we've known for years that those dominant toms at that point are, are not expendable. Therefore, those, those seasons were timed, uh, theoretically should have been timed to protect those birds. But as Brett mentioned, it's mostly been a social and political issue uh, to push seasons earlier so that hunters could, could capture times when birds were gobbling. Uh, what, we, what we've understood also for many years is a lot of that gobbling is associated with, with periods when uh, hens are not receptive. Toms are gobbling, but hens are not breeding with them at that point. Uh, and what like some of the data Brett and I published recently shows that that's about a 45 day lag. So these birds start gobbling about 45 days before uh, this this breeding really ramps up. And that, I mean, that's an important distinction for, for folks to consider. Uh, Brian was asking, what about fire ants? I hear they cause issues in Louisiana. Um, yeah, I mean, don't believe everything you read. There's not roving bands of fire ants taking down turkeys as they walk across the landscape. Um, typically about the only time fire ant problems is if they, they happen to get on a nest right at hatch and they're, they're able to, you know, after, cause the fire ants, I, I mean, I've never seen a fire ant break through an egg before, but I have seen fire ants pile onto a nest that, um, has had, you know, a couple of eggs that have started to hatch and, you know, the poults aren't quite out yet. I have seen that, but it's, it's also pretty rare. Um, I think that very rarely over the last five or six years, we actually had hardly, I can't think of it, one or maybe two nests that have actually had any fire ant damage at all during the kind of hatching activities. So I um, can think of just a couple that I can remember through yeah. many years. So okay. I think they're doing, they're doing, people tend to equate fire ants and quail a lot, but I don't think that they're having a, a lot of impact on turkeys right now. Fair enough. Uh, Joey's asking another one. I think I read somewhere that there is some thought that hens may be a bit more hesitant to mate with subdominant males than previously thought. Is there any truth to this with the use of male decoys? It seems that more hunters are able to kill more dominant males. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so What's important to realize is that, um, P, let me back up, people tend to equate the reproductive biology of turkeys with other animals that they're familiar with, like the reproductive biology of deer, where, you know, a female deer will get bred by, you know, an adult female doe will get bred by a yearling buck um, on a fairly regular occasion. That's not really how it works. Um, female wild turkeys actually select the male they're going to breed with. The male doesn't select the females. The females select the males. And by the female selecting the males, um, if that male, the short version of this is, if that male is removed from her, access, she's no longer, he's no longer accessible for her to breed with, it's not a ladder. And a real smart guy named uh, Bill Healy told this to both Mike and I in his, uh, his house one day that she just doesn't choose to go to the next guy in the hierarchy. She may totally abandon the two that are laid off. There's three of them together and the dominant male gets shot. She may not breed with either one of the subdominant males to that male. She may want to go find somebody else. So there is a lot to be said for the fact that um, the dominant males are important to, as, and it goes back to what Mike was saying earlier, the dominant males are important to the, the overall reproductive ecology of the species. So Mike, that, you want to yep. add in there? No, that's, that's exactly spot on. I think people are really interested in the dominant male. Uh, Ricky's asking when a dominant male turkey is taken from the landscape during breeding season, is that bird, which did the majority of the breeding, replaced by another male fairly quickly? Or does taking that dominant male create a void that could affect successful breeding? Well, a really smart guy who's sitting just to the side of me came up with an analogy that he gave in a presentation about a year ago, I think the first time. And, and uh, Ricky, it's like a light bulb goes off on the landscape. Um, so if you, if you imagine that you've got these, these light bulbs on the landscape and there are these groups of breeding males, and as you slowly remove males from the landscape, and, and we're all turkey hunters here, so we're not, I'm not criticizing hunting at all, and I want to be very clear about that, um, but we're talking about what impact it has on reproduction. Um, as you remove these, these selected upon males from the landscape, the light bulb may get a little bit dimmer that year for that particular area, and it doesn't make a lot of sense until you realize 
that females are existing on the landscape in these groups that are kind of tied to these dominant males. So you may have 10 or 11 females that are on the landscape tied to this group of two or three males. And if a dominant male is removed and most of the females have cued in on that male to be the breeder, the, the, the one they want to breed with, then there may be actually a lag in breeding as they all, as the females go and kind of reevaluate who they want to try and reproduce with. And we're actually doing some really neat work, both Mike and I right now, on some of that, looking at the amount of time it takes for a flock of females that's out there on the landscape by itself to actually get everybody out to the nest the first time. So I hope that answers Ricky's question. Yeah, and I would just add, if you look at other species that use mating systems that mimic what wild turkeys do, this kind of Fred alluded to this group of males that have a, a group of females that hang around with them. There's been a lot of research on critters like this, fallow deer, prairie chicken, sharp-tailed grouse, sage grouse. And when you go in and you take one of those dominant breeding males out of that group, some of these females just delay breeding. They, they just don't look, like Brett said, they don't just go to the second step and laugh and say, well, you're good enough. Had he been good enough from the beginning, she would have bred with him and she didn't. She chose to breed with dominant bird. So it's not as simple as just taking the top bird out and saying, well, there's two others standing there. They'll just go ahead and, and breed. That, that's not how sexual selection works. And that's not how turkeys and, and other species use the mating system this bird uses. That's not how they operate. When that dominant bird's removed, she goes through her checks and balances again. And like Brett said, she, she may actually abandon that group and go start visiting other groups of toms, if assuming she has availability to them. And she goes through her process again. She, she decides who is the best, who's the fittest. And then she, you know, decides whether she wants to, to breed with them. It's, it's just not as simple as well. It's just the next man up. It's not, that's not the case with turkeys. Yeah. And to add one more thing to that, cause we always get this question, do Jake's breed? No, they don't. They, yeah. they may, they may physiologically attempt it, but their body hasn't uh, undergone a spermatogenesis. So they're not creating viable semen. So they do not contribute reproductively to the population the year after they're born. And they have to be at least two years old. We had um, a couple questions on gobbling. Mm -hmm. um, Oscar and Corey were, Corey was asking about, you know, why don't turkeys gobble like they used to in the old days? That's what he asked. And then Oscar's saying, what about gobbling and how hunting pressure affects it? Um, okay. Uh, so why don't turkeys gobble like the, I, I don't know. Everything's always better in the old days, I'll admit, for myself as well. Um, I think what we, what we see is, You know what? I don't know why they don't gobble like they did in the old days, but I can tell you, you know, I mean, I don't have a good reason for what, what it didn't happen back then, but let me step on the second one and then talk a little bit about gobbling and hunters and, and how they interact. Um, so the number one predator of, of wild turkeys, a male wild turkeys is humans, period. End of story. Um, you know, hunters harvest for is, is additive. So, you know, what birds we harvest, typically most of them would probably survive if they didn't get shot. And, and we're, a, we're the primary predator of male wild turkeys, and that's okay. Um, but what we're starting to see is with the use of these, we have these really cool things, and they're called uh, automated recording units, ARUs. Um, but basically, they're tape recorders, you know, that you put, or I guess iPods or whatever you want to call it these days. But you put them up in a tree, and they record all the sound all day long. And then we go in, and we listen to all that sound, and we evaluate how frequently birds are gobbling, how many times we hear gobbles, what time of day they gobble, um, all these kind of things. And, and what we're finding out is that um, on places where there's not a lot of hunting pressure, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overly generalize here from a few studies that Mike and I are engaged in. Okay. On places that don't have a ton of hunting pressure, gobbling is fairly uniform and is fairly extensive, meaning that it starts in about March and it goes pretty consistently into June and a little bit into July. Um, on some of the places that get hunted hard, you know, have a lot of hunting activity, um, gobbling tends to trail off a lot earlier. Um, it's two things. It's one, when you harvest a male, he can't gobble anymore. 
So by definition, if you take somebody off the landscape, they can't make noise. But it's also the males that are out there may be the smart ones. And Mike found some of this results in a study in Tunica where they may just be quiet. And, and I think some of the thought by some of the biologists is, is that maybe turkeys are adapting a little bit to where if I am not loud, I survive better. Um, that's that's a, a thought that I think we're kind of, you know, thinking now. But there's definitely an impact of, of just the general idea of hunting activity on uh, gobbling activity. Uh, Mike, you want to add anything to that? Just that, I mean, we're seeing, you're seeing this in a lot of critters. There's work ongoing with elk and, and other species showing that as you hunt these animals, they, they figure out where risky places are and what risky behaviors are, and they change those behaviors or they change the places they're using on the landscape. And I, I think the gobbling data that Brett just talked about speaks volumes to that. This bird, they, they respond to pressure. If it's tough pressure, hard pressure, think public areas with a lot of activity. Uh, we've seen some, some sites where gobbling essentially goes to zero by the middle of April, middle, you know, towards the end of April. And in the absence of hunting or much reduced hunting pressure, think quota hunting, uh, a few days a week, off, on, off, you know, those types of hunts, you see the gobbling trail off when the pressure picks up. And then as soon as the pressure's off, it, it goes right back to where it, where it should be or where it was prior to, to the hunting starting. So I think we're definitely seeing this bird reacting to, to pressure on the landscape. Whether it, it's not saying it's just hunting pressure, I think it's very likely pressure from, from not only human hunters, but also other hunters, natural hunters during the spring that are taking birds that are causing this animal to change their tactics. Yep. They're adapting. Yeah. Uh, Adapt or die. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Mike's asking, I'm not a fan of it, but do you think a hunting cutoff time of say one would have a significant effect on the declining population? I know some states have that rule probably on public land only, being a public land hunter almost exclusively, I ask this with bated breath because it seems public land hunters seem to be the guinea pig of any changes. Here in South Carolina, we already lose days due to no Sunday hunting. So I would hate to lose more hunting hours over this. Um, you know, most birds get shot in the morning. At the, I mean, at the end of the day, again, going back to the fact that I'm trying to take a very 10,000 foot view and not worry, you know, concern myself with one little place. On average, most turkeys are shot in the morning. So, I mean, there's been some work that looked at early shutoff times for various, you know, WMAs and various properties over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, I don't think it's shown a, had a huge impact. I don't personally think it's going to have a huge impact because most hunters, I mean, some of the work we've done, I mean, most hunters hunt six to nine. I mean, that's kind of the window. And the reason they hunt that are six to 10. And the reason they hunt that is because that's when the birds are typically most active gobbling. Now, that doesn't mean I, I saw a guy post something on, I think it was Wild Turkey Reports Twitter account today about how he shot a bird at 11 o'clock that day. Awesome, right? And, and there are people, you know, you're going to shoot birds at two o'clock in the afternoon, but most hunting occurs in the morning. So I don't really think a shutoff time is going to have a population level impact. No, I don't. Mike, do you disagree? No, I agree. I understand why states do that. I mean, there, there's yeah. reasons for trying to reduce activity in the afternoons. Yeah. I grew up in a state that Virginia did that for many years. Um, and I, I understand the logic behind it. I, I tend to agree with Brad. I don't, I don't think it will do much from a population standpoint. Um, I want to ask this one. So Skip asked uh, earlier, but he asked again. He said, many hunters blame coyotes for turkey decline. I know we talked about it, but just to elaborate for him. But also, he says, they also blame intense growing season burns. Your your thoughts. So I guess he's talking about prescribed fires. Sure. Hey, Skip, do you want me to do coyotes again, Ann, or just... Uh, um, just briefly mention it, maybe. Uh, Skip, um, what I said earlier is, you know, obviously at some point, you know, coyotes are going to occasionally catch a, an adult and occasionally get a nest. But, you know, whenever we think about the, the broader scheme of what predates turkeys, um, you know, we tend to, you know, most of the pictures we get of coyotes in our incubation ranges where we've got digital cameras set up, they're carrying deer. 
Um, they're not really carrying turkeys. Um, I know they eat turkeys. I've seen them eat turkeys, but I don't think that they're the, you know, the, the Southeastern werewolf and, and everybody makes them out to be. Um, I, I mean, obviously they are going to have an impact as do a, a host of other predators. Um, but relative to things like bobcats, uh, owls, um, and, you know, for males, man, I don't think the coyotes are, are as big an impact as people let on. Um, now, now, fire is a different question. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion in the southeastern United States about the utilization of prescribed burning on national forests and, and private land as well. Um, and so there's been a lot of discussion. And most of that discussion is kind of uh, focused on timing of whether or not we're burning up turkey nests is really what it comes down to. That, that tends to be the concern that most people have. Um, so with some of the research that we've been doing on most of our study sites in the Southeast are actually on public land. Um, most of them are, we do have some on private. Most of them are actually burned on a, you know, three to three year rotation, three to four year rotation, sometimes a little bit longer, never really less than that. Um, when you think about what a turkey is looking for to where she puts her nest, what we find inordinate evidence of is that these birds like to nest in areas that are typically one to two years post burn. So these are areas that are, you know, like two year roughs, uh, not something that's, you know, three or four years post burn. Those are the areas that are typically getting rotated in and getting burned. Um, we've monitored hundreds of nests in areas that are burned. Um, and I can only think, and Mike helped me out, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that nests don't get burned because they do, okay? But I can only think of a couple of nests that we've ever had from our transmitted birds that have been in areas that were kind of scheduled for burns over the last five or six years. Um, I don't think we are at the broad scale actually burning turkey nests up to the detriment of the population. I think that where the birds are nesting and where the fires are occurring are two separate vegetative communities separated by about a year or two in vegetative growth. Um, so I don't think that it's having a negative impact. And I tell you what, I'd rather have fire on the landscape than not have it on the landscape. Now, I'm going to ask Mike because He's done a lot of work on this to talk about shape and scale of fire, because I think that comes into play here, and he's a little bit more of an expert on that than I am. Mike, you want to swing at that? Yeah, so the, the question, uh, I think specifically in the question he asked about growing season fires, I, I believe, and mm -hmm. you may check that, but yeah, so Brett mentioned the, the fire issue is really a scale and a timing issue. You know, the timing issue, what you see, overwhelmingly across the landscape is most fire is applied in the dormant season. As a general rule, most fire on our sites, about 70% is, is in the dormant season. So most of these fires are occurring before the bird is, is nesting anyway. Now, I'm fully aware of the horror stories of, you know, large scale, several thousand acre burn in late April, early May. I, I get it. Uh, from a broad landscape perspective, that has very little impact on turkey populations. I would much rather have fire on the landscape, like Brett said, than not. But what we definitely see is a scale issue. Uh, turkeys are not selecting fires that are thousands of acres in size. They, they tend to be edge species. They use a couple hundred yards inside of these burns after the fires occur, and that affects uh, moves on for months after the fire. It's not just an immediate impact. So this bird sees these fires differently than we do. They very clearly have demonstrated to us through their movements that uh, stay about 200, 250 yards away from an unburned stand. That's as far as they're going for several months after the fire. So if you think about it from a scale perspective, which our research has found, you know, 500 acres, once you get above that, these birds essentially stop selecting the stands that are burned. Scales that are smaller than that, they actually select those stands. They use those stands disproportionately more than other stands on the landscape. So from a management perspective, that's, that's a critical distinction. Go above and beyond 500 acres, particularly in the growing season, and you could have some issues. You know, obviously, uh, we want the 
bar to benefit from this management strategy. I mean, turkeys are inextricably linked to fire in the southeast and have been for millennia. We just need to, to make sure that our fire prescriptions are more commensurate with the bird's ecology. And, and what we found is, is 500 and less is the, is the ideal the ideal size. Or is better if you can do it. Yeah. Cool. Any idea, Richard's asking, any idea how many years a wild turkey hen can live if she would die of old age? <laughs> um, I've heard 20, but I can't verify it. The oldest one I've ever had was... Uh, we had one that was banded that we found dead, um, unpredated, just dead, uh, and she was nine. Um, but that's that's a that's an old female. Um, I'd say that the average lifespan for probably a turkey is about three to four years. Um, probably for a male in a natural system, about the same in a hunted system, maybe take a year off of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you figure probably maybe three. Three to five years is probably about average for you know an old bird to be an old bird. Um, I think we had one from Tallahala back in the '90s that yeah. I think was captured in like 1988 and was recaptured or found dead in like '97 or something like my la the last year of my study. So she was basically a decade old, which I, that's about the oldest I can remember. So Brett's nine i think is probably pretty close yeah old bird old bird <laughs> um uh y'all want to take a y'all don't have to answer this if you don't want to it's more of like a hunter question sure. um chris is asking no doubt there is scientific evidence to delay the season in louisiana no about no doubt about that based on the research but in that move the next year we lost seven thousand estimated hunters in 2018 in 2019 we lost an additional 2700 we are now down to an estimated 10,000 hunters and I'm afraid we may be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, if we continue losing hunters, we can't save the habitat and more WMAs will be lost. Would you think maybe a regional late opener versus early opener approach would be better? Delay the season on lands with critical losses of birds, but maybe go back to an early opener in areas without such a loss? To keep some hunters that's buying tough, That's a tough question. Yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, you know, Mike, the, the work that I do and the work that Mike does in all science, it, it's used to inform policy decisions. Um, it, it may not always be utilized in the in the way that you know we envision it. Um, but but that's a tough question on whether or not you can selectively choose to open certain areas at certain times and open other areas later. Because what you get into, and the only thing I'll really be able to address here, and that's a really good question for your state turkey biologist. Um, but the, the only one I can address here is, is you get into the movement problem in that turkey hunters move and we hunt where seasons are open and we all do it, myself included. I, I, I go to where I can hunt and I go. To, so you can't, you know, prescribe a, a late season, you know, an early season in one part of a state and a later season in another part of a state because what's going to happen is everybody's going to go hunt in the earlier area. And then they're going to go back and hunt in the later area. So I think that that's why, and I'm guessing here because I don't make regulatory decisions uh, as a scientist for a university, but I, I, su I would suspect that that probably is one of the reasons that states like Louisiana don't want to have significantly a lot of different structure in their hunting seasons. It's a lot different for something like ducks, you know, when everybody's got property and blinds and all that kind of stuff that they maintain. They're not picking that stuff up and moving it 150 miles north. So it's a little bit easier for something like that. But for a turkey hunter that's got a vest and a shotgun and ample public land, you can bounce across those season boundaries pretty easy. So I would bet that that's probably part of the reason. Um, as to whether we should go to a later opener, um, it, it's all context dependent. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier with regard to hunting activity and hunting pressure and particularly breaking up some of these males before they've bred females and those type of things. Um, but it's it's all a matter, I think, of, of perspective. And that's why a lot of the science Mike and I are working on right now is what we're trying to do is use that to inform and support our state agency kind of brethren so that they can take that to the commissions and the people that actually make the decisions about when turkey season should be. So it's all yeah, I, I would just add, Chris, that is a really good question. And that, that's a question that a lot of people above my pay grade are talking about because we don't set regulations, obviously. But um, 
when you have a species that is is declining in areas and you're trying to recruit hunters and, and retain hunters that is a serious that is a serious quagmire um and i don't i don't envy at all the managers that that have to make those decisions because uh we're in a situation now where where you have a bird that is declining in areas and, and you have people that are justifiably upset about it and then on the flip side like you mentioned we we're in a critical need from a funding standpoint to the main hunters on the landscape and if we don't the things that we use those funds to do which is manage our landscapes becomes compromised so we we're really in a, in a difficult situation um and I, I mean that's an excellent question but the answers are just they're so complex and, and take us a number of beers to get through uh the answers to that yeah and it told us nothing but water tonight so <laughs> yeah you know, yeah I, I said water just keep it Very specific <laughs> It wasn't my fault. <laughs> um, Jeff is asking over here, what are your thoughts on the differences in annual survival of adult male turkeys in light versus heavy harvest areas? Mississippi research shows that hunters were killing around 60% of the adult males on the landscape and annual survival was around 40%. And in recent Missouri studies, the harvest mortality was around 30%, but annual survival uh, was the same as Mississippi at 40 so are we simply leaving more birds on the landscape to die from other sources? No, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, also, and I think I'm familiar with the work in, in Mississippi and I, and I'm, I know about the work in Missouri. Um, so typically harvest, harvest of wild turkeys is additive to natural mortality. We're fairly certain about that with regards to adults. At least it's, it's mostly additive, extremely close to being fully additive. Um, if I remember right, and I don't know which study in Mississippi you're referencing, but I think that they had really, really, really high harvest rates. It was 60% or it was pretty, you know, they were taking a lot of males off the landscape. You're also talking about uh, two entirely different systems from an ecological perspective here. Um, you know, the, the northern Missouri area was where Van Gilder uh, and uh, Krzyzewski did all their work and published a big monograph in, I think, 92, I think it was, or 95. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. And uh, Mike actually is probably more of an expert on the Mississippi stuff from his dissertation at Tallahalla. So do you want to stab on this one? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Jeff has actually emailed me, uh, if, if memory serves me. I think he's emailed me this this question and we, we bounced things back and forth or maybe messaged me through Facebook. I don't, I don't recall. But um, but yeah, if, if you're referencing the work from Tallahalla and or the work from the Florida parishes where Jimmy Stafford had started that work. Yeah, the, the harvest rates were incredibly high. Um, and that data set actually encapsulated multiple regulations changes as well. Yeah. Um, and to Brad's point about it, harvest being additive, all that means is that from all the science that's been published with very few exceptions, toms that are shot would have otherwise lived. They, yes. You see very low natural mortality. Yeah, I mean, owls kill a few and cats kill a few. That happens. But by and large, harvest is, is additive, meaning if we don't shoot those birds, they make it another year. Um, I, I can't really answer the, the discrepancy between those two data sets, except to say that uh, I don't think we're leaving, if the, if the question is, and I, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but if the question is, are we leaving birds on the landscape and there, and ergo harvest is, is compensatory, in other words, that some of these birds are, are dying from lots of other causes or whatever, I, I don't think that's the case, but, but again, I, I don't know the, the intricacies of that work in Missouri. Um, thank y'all for elaborating on it. Uh, Will's asking, with the talk around the impact of shooting a dominant gobbler, could there be a benefit of not shooting the strutter when multiple gobblers come in? You know, <laughs> potentially, but but the problem is the dominant gobbler may not be the one strutting too. Um, you know, that may be that may be a younger guy trying to show off and get attention. Um, typically these males have established a very rigorous order of who's in charge. And Mike and I have both seen a picture the other day that was just, it was great. But you can't, you can't always tell 
that when you're looking at a group. Um, what, what I can say is, is that if a group of three comes in and all three of them get shot, then the light bulb for that area and that flock of hens that they're probably messing around with shut off. Um, but I don't think hunters can individually, I, I, all right, I probably have stared as many turkeys as anybody. I don't think I could tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt on any particular day without watching one flock continuously that that one is the truly dominant one because they're constantly shuffling. They're constantly, you know, they get it into their order, but they're still bumping into each other and everything. So I, I don't think there's a chance that someone could just, you know, say, oh, it's that strutter. I, I don't think that's possible. Um, it might it'd be really interesting to experimentally try and manipulate that and see what happens from a reproductive standpoint, but I don't have the ability to do it. Uh, yeah, that I would just add, uh, we don't really know when we look at birds, we don't know who the dominant bird is. Yeah. Turkeys have used a form of kin selection. And, and what that means is these groups of toms that you're seeing that are strutting together, they are either brothers or and or they're toms that have grown up together. So these birds were young birds, either raised by a group of hen or they um, assimilated into a group of jakes and they've spent time around each other their whole lives. And they have established these hierarchies that they test constantly, but not all things set off a fight. So you could have three birds that come in strutting and there could be a, what you're calling a strutter that the dominant bird is tolerating that because they use this form of kin selection. And what that means is if you have a group of three toms, they're, they're more showy, there's more gobbling, there's more strutting, they attract more attention. So whoever the dominant breeder is in that group, he is going to get more breeding opportunities if all of those birds are displaying converse, you know, compared to say just him standing there displaying. There's more, it's more showy, it looks better, it attracts more attention. The problem is we don't know who that is. Um, it could be any of those times when they walk up there. So that that kind of goes back to the, the timing of the season question that came up earlier. It, it There's a distinct possibility that maybe prior to some point, none of these times are expendable. Maybe prior to a certain point, because we don't know who the dog bird is, maybe none of these birds are expendable and we, we should let things proceed as they should. Uh, sometimes an unpopular statement to make, but, but the more we learn about this bird, the more we realize that these pecking orders and the way that this bird operates is more complex than what we thought. And it, it really complicates questions like Will's, because I've been asked that a lot. And I thought the same thing. It's like, well, damn, could I, if I just paid really close attention to what was happening, could could I pick out the dominant bird and not shoot him? And mm -hmm. I think the, I think the short answer is no, there's, it's just too much going on that, that as a hunter, you don't see before the bird shows up, you know, in front of down the gun barrel. There's just so much that's happened that you're unaware of. Okay. Uh, Buddy's asking, there was recently management done on public land here in Oklahoma where crews manually removed red cedars in areas known for Turkey. Will that management disturb their patterns to the point where it would be smart to avoid during the season in the next week? No, probably not. Actually, uh, there was some really neat work that uh, I was engaged in uh, there in northern Texas um, uh, in conjunction with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and uh, NWTF. Um, they were doing some cedar removal and some mulching and that kind of stuff and some just nasty thick areas where birds won't go. So um, turkeys like to be able to see. OK, they don't they don't want to be in places that they can't be very far. So these areas where you get these nasty, thick areas of cedar and, you know, ash juniper and red cedar and, you know, mesquite and wee satch and all that kind of stuff. The birds, it's like a fence line. Birds don't want to go in there. But some of the clearing that's being done, and, and I'm assuming that that's probably what's happening here, some of the clearing that's being done that's opening up some of these areas, and I don't want to say making them more savanna-like, but making them more open right now, that's going to actually, in the long run, maybe not next week, but in the long run, going to actually lead to more use of that area, as opposed to probably what it was getting used right now. And we've seen a lot of evidence of some of this, uh, you know, opening up the landscapes a little bit, not clear cutting by any means, but open up the landscape um, tends to help these birds utilize more uh, 
uh, space on the landscape. Uh, Joey's saying, I saw Mike's post on Twitter a couple of days ago discussing cover and nest success. Can you talk about that a little more in depth? Uh, yeah. Do you want Mike to talk about it or me? Mike, you want to do it? Oh, you can cover this one. Okay. This is in your wheelhouse for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys probably, many of you don't know, is that Mike and I are, are both professionals and we've been working together for almost a decade now on turkeys. So, so it's kind of seven of one, five of another, so to speak. Um, so one of the things that my, what Mike had posted was a picture of successful and failed nests. And the discussion was, we've measured historically, and I mean for a long time, um, all the way back to work with, by Lovett Williams, you know, back in the 1970s and through the 80s and 90s and Mike's career and mine, we've always measured vegetation nest sites with the assumption that the vegetation at the nest site has some ability to mitigate nest loss. And what that means is, is that if we go out and find a measurement of, you know, it's got 42% screening cover, or there's this many trees near it, or the vegetation is this tall, we can then use that to predict whether or not nests are going to be successful or fail. And then we can manage for those type of vegetative communities. Well, the problem is, is that most studies historically have had 30 nests, 25 nests. I mean, I, I mean, 16 nests, you know, whenever we start looking at these big data sets that we're starting to acquire with a thousand nest sites and, you know, measurements of vegetation conducted the same way at a thousand nest sites over six years, what we thought were patterns have disappeared. Um, what we thought were things that were truisms for turkey biologists are kind of going away. General things that we know, turkeys like to select areas that typically have cover, except for the few that don't. And turkeys like to select areas that they can get out of very quickly because if the females, females will always avoid dying over trying to protect the nest. So if a bobcat comes in, a female is gone. A coyote comes in, a female is gone. They're not going to defend the nest against something that can eat them. Um, so the question becomes, have we maybe either not been measuring the right vegetation metric or should we be measuring something other than the vegetation that's right at the nest site? Um, so for instance, maybe the question isn't how much or how tall the vegetation is at the nest site. Maybe the question is how much scent can get through the vegetation at the nest site given a wind direction and a wind speed. Uh -huh. Maybe the question isn't the importance of the vegetation right at the nest site, which I mean, and if you think about a nest bowl, it's, you know, 12 inches across. Maybe the question is, what does the stand vegetative community look like in a half acre around the nest site? Um, maybe, so, so those are some of the things that, you know, science progresses slowly and sometimes we get stuck in ruts and, and I'm a scientist that does this. So sometimes we get stuck in ruts where we do the same thing and you kind of have to think outside the rut a little bit. And that's what we're trying to do. I'm not sure we're right. Um, but the big question that I think Mike's Facebook post was trying to spur was, you know, we see these really divergent areas that these birds use to nest in. How can we measure something accurately that's going to predict nest success if the birds don't use it and be successful every time? And that's kind of what we don't see a lot of evidence of is that success seems almost to be random on the landscape. Yeah, that, that was the exact point of the, the post that and to generate questions like this, because much, much of why those posts are put out every week is I'm trying to generate people to think I'm trying to get discussions going. I'm trying to get people asking these types of questions. And Brett's spot on is the bottom line is I think we've probably looked at this wrong and we're, we're looking at things that are occurring right around a nest site, right around this spot that she's sitting at when in reality, it's probably much more complex, much different scale than that. And there, it could be things like Brett just said, like olfaction and air and these things that, that we just really haven't paid much attention to in our, in our zeal for, 
trying to identify that this is better than that or that's better than this. And like Brett said, this bird nests everywhere. I mean, they nest in all sorts of places and there's just no commonality in these nest sites. Um, I think a lot of what was found in earlier studies, which was some of our own work, was was just spurious patterns because you had 30 nests and you had a, a couple of outliers that, that changed the data set. And the next thing you know, the conclusion is, well, more canopy is better or less canopy is better. And when you start looking across you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you just find that there is no pattern. This yeah. bird is just so diverse in the way they're so they're so plastic. The way I think about it, they're just they just figure out where they need to be and where they think they can give it a shot for 28 days, and that's where they go sit. And just to add this, because Mike said plastic here, and I think that that's probably the most important thing that we don't realize, but we where we tend not to think about is you know we're talking about a species that's a broad generalist. I mean, turkeys exist in Maine and Michigan and the swamps of Florida and Louisiana and the plains of the Dakotas and the mountains of Oregon and the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico. And yet they all nest in all these different conditions. They all use all these different habitats. So to, to think that there's a single, if there's a single measurement that works for all, we haven't, fig I haven't figured out what it is yet. Um, you know, I think what it comes down to is less trying to manage specifically yep. for a particular item and trying to manage for availability of vegetation on the landscape that they can then select to be in. So y'all, y'all are killing. Well, all right. Well, if you're happy, we're happy. What I wanted to... <laughs> um, David Strickland's got a long one. I think Mike fell off there for a second. So what you got? Did you oh, did I? Yeah. Can you say it again? I was just going to be kind of a thought, but just what Brett said. Maybe we need to start thinking about this differently and stop worrying about trying to do standard this and as much landscape nesting habitat as possible. Yeah. No, nope, I'm you getting that, great. Brett? Yeah, I got it. What Mike said, he was cracking out there a little bit, but he said basically that um, what we need to think about is less less focus on right in on where the nest is and creating as much available condition that the birds can get to is, is the general just that. And it seems like Mike fell off for a second. We must have scared him. So, <laughs> no, what did you, you said David had a question. Is that right? He's got a long one, so bear with me. Um, he said. Yeah, I'll try and cover while Mike's out for a second. Let's see. He's he's trying to get in here again. He says, I don't, Mike, we can't see you. Uh, I don't think you will find much argument to your thoughts on growing season fire until you study the new USFS prescribed fire regimes across the Southeast. Could you? Yeah. Uh, Service EA right now, yeah. Okay. Keep going. What I have found in the Southeast as to national forest is a change from compartment sizes from around 500 acres to several thousand acres. Not only has the size changed, but also the intensity has changed with the new push towards fire resilient landscapes and the push towards long leaves. The new EA out for the Francis Marion National Forest lists most of your research as supporting evidence, which ironically contradicts exactly what your research found as to the allowances of hardwoods interspersed into the upland pine habitat, the return interval and preferred nesting habitat. Um, have either of you taken note of this new fire resilient and prescribed fire policy as pushed by the nature service into the writings of forest plans as it relates to the success of the Eastern wild Turkey? Okay. Hey, David. Um, so I haven't seen the EA for Francis Marion yet, mm -hmm. admittedly. I, Mike, have you seen it yet? I, I haven't I seen have it. I have not. I have read uh, well, David's question kind of streamed. On, I'm, I'm, my internet is really terrible here. Uh, so I was trying to read it when I cut out. Um, I'm not I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I'm know. not. I, I, David, I, I, don't, I don't like it. But I plan to be. Yeah, I don't like passing on a question right now. But that was pretty detailed. And without having read the EA, I'm a little bit concerned that I might say something that's not correct. So I'll make you a deal. I know how, that you know how to find me and Mike. And if you'll let us get our hands on the EA, uh, we can come up with a response to that a little bit down the road, if you don't mind. I, I hope he's okay with that. 
Yeah, you want to tell him how yeah. to contact you? Yeah, he, David, I, we know how to get to each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we can get in touch. Um, let's see. Do we have any? Off, honestly, but I don't want to say anything not having read that ecological assessment yet. I got you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I'd, I'd like to see it myself. Hold on. I think, guys, we a little ran over the um, hour, so we're gonna we're gonna cut it off. But um, I want to thank y'all for being here. And uh, they, we did have one question on any any tips for new turkey hunters. <laughs> I know that's not really y'all's area, <laughs> but um, surprised uh, at how many new turkey hunters I suspect Mike and I have taken in our lives. Hey, uh, y'all would know best. Yeah, uh, don't think that you have to harvest a bird to have a successful hunt. Right. How's that for a tip? I agree. Last year was my first year bow hunting and I did not get a turkey, but man, it was cool. I, I saw one come in and everything and I scared that sucker off, but it was an awesome experience. My tip would be identify people that are willing to mentor you and be as persistent as you possibly can. Don't quit. Don't get frustrated. Don't give up. Get out every chance you can and try to find people that you can learn from mm -hmm. and and just go trial and error and you're going to make mistakes and you just got to learn to live with it. And that's, and that's part of the, that's part of the fun of chasing this bird is, is getting beaten so many times. So don't get frustrated and don't give up. And I guarantee to you that if you find your local NWTF chapter, there will be certainly someone in there who will assist with mentoring you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. And is there a way that people can follow y'all on Twitter? If you want to give it out, it's up to y'all. Yeah, so um, Mike's significantly more active on the social media, um, but uh, my Twitter handle is at Dr. Shortspur. It's uh, D-R-S-H-O-R-T-S-P-U-R. And uh, Mike, you can give yours out because you got Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and something else, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so mine is just uh, Wild Turkey Doc on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, just the, the word Wild Turkey and then D-O-C. And then on Facebook, if you just search on my name, you'll find me. I, uh, my Facebook page is just my page. So, but I post the same content on all three platforms, and um, should have a YouTube channel pretty soon that's that's going to stream some kind of informative videos of what we're doing and what it means and and how uh, it could be informative to people. Yeah, and in addition to that, I mean, both Mike and I are university faculty members. Obviously, me at LSU and Mike at the University of Georgia. You can you can Google our names and you can find us. You can you can yeah. find access to us pretty easy that way as well. We we typically yeah absolutely the first couple absolutely. Of, you know we're state employees, so we get emails and contacted all the time. So you know I don't want to say don't hesitate, but um, you know if you have questions, you can get us at Twitter or Facebook, and we're usually pretty good about it. I just want to say, yeah, thank y'all again for coming on and like really talking about the research, talking about the importance of it. And I'm going to end on this comment because Andy said it over here. He said, thank you all for your research, making it more available to us as hunters. And so we can pass it on to our legislatures and for putting this on today. So yeah. anyway, glad to participate. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Let's do it. We will. Y'all tune in next time. Bye. Thanks, Anna. All right. Take care.